Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Great morning. Hey, get up. Get ready. Hands up. Let's get ready for the word. Let's get ready to jump into worship. How many of you know this is the day that the Lord has made? And we will rejoice and be glad in it. I am honored to be standing in front of you today. Hey, uh, if you have a prayer request, I want you to drop it in the in the comment section this morning. Uh, we are praying for the members of this church. But this morning, we want to remember the President of the United States, President Donald Trump, and First Lady Melania Trump, as they are fighting uh, COVID. Uh, we are, as believers, to pray for those that are in authority, and the President of the United States is in authority, whether we like him or not. Uh, this is not about voting, but I'm asking you, as citizens of the kingdom of God, to remember them in, in prayer today, this week. I want you to save the date. Save the date. October the 18th. Write that down. Put it in the refrigerator. October the 18th. We are coming together. We are coming together for a time of fellowship, laughter, fun, and guess what? And food. We are coming here at the church, October the 18th, out here in these side, on these sidewalks. We're putting up tables. We're bringing out the food. And we need you to be here, October the 18th. Hey, we have sent you an email. If you didn't get an email from us, giving you some inform information about what's coming up, go ahead and inbox us. Inbox us your email address and we'll be sure to send you that email. I'm looking forward to you being here with us October the 18th. Well, let's get ready to go into praise and worship with none other than Psalmist Michelle Luster. I'm excited about worship today. I'm so glad I serve a faithful God. Great is his faithfulness unto us. Hallelujah, so we worship him today. Oh, 
when I think about the Lord. All it takes is a memory. That's it. And just think about everything that he's done for you, even this year. All the things he's brought us through. needed that. I don't know about you, but I needed that. I needed to be in the presence of God this morning. Hey, if you know someone that needs to get in God's presence this morning, that that's not a part that you don't see online right now, make sure that you call them, text them, and tell them you need to watch this service. Thank you, Minister Michelle. Also, thank you, Wayne, and thank you, Jeff. Uh, for being a part of the band. 
we, I tell you, we really appreciate you all. And I want to give special thanks to the media department. Um, this morning we have uh, on the sound Walter Dial and, and Dexter Adams and camera with uh, LaVoy, um, LaVoy Nance. We love you guys. We cannot do, without, do this without you. Those of you that, that are looking for an opportunity to serve, um, all you have to do is say the word. We have opportunities all over this ministry for you to serve. Amen. I was just, I was just meeting, I went to visit uh, my Aunt Cora this week, and we had fellowship, and she was saying how she needed something to do. And I said to her, Aunt Cora, as soon as we're back in the building, we're going to put you to work. And so she got excited about that. I'm telling you, if you want to serve, you have come to the right place. Well, let's get ready. Let's get ready to honor the Lord with our giving. Here, here's a good chance for you to clap. Here, here's a good chance for you to hit those hearts uh, as, you, as you normally do when someone is preaching real good. I get excited. I don't know about you, but I get excited when it's time to give. I, I'm not being hypocritical. I am not, I'm not trying to manipulate you to give. But I get excited when it's time to give. You know why? Because God has blessed me to give. I'll give you another reason. Because I remember a time when I didn't have to give. And I wanted to give so, so badly. Deanna and I, we, we look for opportunities to give. Not, not just in the house of the Lord. That comes first. That is non-negotiable. We're going to pay our tithes, and we're going to give. I'm going to get you a, a scripture, and it comes from uh, First Chronicles 29, verse 12. First Chronicles 29, verse 12. It says, "Both riches and honor come from you, talking to God, and you reign over all, over all of us. In your hand is power." In might, in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. I'm going to I want to tell you, if you have been blessed to give, I'm going to tell you, don't miss this opportunity to give. You'll see on the screen ways that you can give. You can text to give. You can mail in your offering. And, and I think you can go to the website and give. I'm so honored. I am so happy to be able to do life with you. And I want to thank you for doing life with me, Deanna, and the rest of this TEC family. Great morning, TEC. It's so wonderful to be back. So wonderful to be back together and learning. I am really excited about our lesson today. Can you just give God praise for that worship before we get started on this word? Oh my goodness. The worship that God has planted in this house. I'm so grateful for that. And so I just want to give him praise for that right now. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Amen. So if you guys are ready, grab your Bibles, your notes, your iPads, whatever it is that you work with, and let's get ready to jump into this word. I am excited. It is a part two of last week. Last week we began to talk about, um, back in March, the Lord gave me this download, just a straight download on um, goals, but he was saying that the all of the the um, bookstores and magazine racks and articles after articles online are all filled with self help opportunities. How you can um, reach this goal or make that goal or make this million or have a great retirement. All these different things. And he said to me, he said, I don't, 
I, um, there aren't very many resources on teaching people what they're doing to sabotage their goals. And so he began to give me a direct download of ways that people ruin their own goals, ways that they sabotage their own success. And so um, the thought is that it's a book of some kind, which I have not obviously written yet, but I am taking the notes and I wanna share them with you today because um, they are timely, they are critical, and there's a lot of seed that's been planted that has begun to harvest during this pandemic. Um, oftentimes, more millionaires are born during a time of financial crisis than any other time. So during this time that we've had this shutdown, I know that God has been doing amazing things um, in TEC and even when I speak with my friends um, in other states, God's just doing really wonderful things. So as we prepare for what he has done and prepare for what he has established in our lives for such a time as this, let's be mindful of how um, we can support our goals and not ruin our goals. So before we get started, I just wanna to go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you, Lord God, for your wisdom inside of us, our, our hearts inside of us, God, as we keep our focus on you, Lord. You said you'd keep those in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. So I thank you, Lord God, in every area of our lives, God. We focus on you, God. We seek your wisdom. We seek your way, God. I thank you for that, Lord. I, I lean in to hear your voice, God, that I would be able to communicate these points with great clarity and understanding, God, that we can apply them to our lives, God, that they would be fruitful to us, God, and us be that we would be fruitful to the kingdom of God. I thank you for it, Lord, and I give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we talked about how our self-speak is so important, especially in our goals and reaching those, attaining those goals that God has established for us. And so I just want to um, pick up, last week we did one through 15, and I told you that he had given me over 40, um, 40 plus um, ways that people ruin their goals. I'm not gonna, of course, do all 40 of them today, but last week we ended with number 15, which was that they don't have um, time alone with God, that they just are too busy or going and fail to make God a priority in their lives. And we have to have that. We have to have that instruction. I like to get that instruction first thing in the morning. Some people get it at night and they marinate over it um, during their sleep, let their spirit um, massage that into their hearts. Whatever works for you, make sure that you do not fail to have time alone with God. It is absolutely essential um, for us to do that for clarity. So we're gonna pick up at number 16. Number 16, the 16th way that God gave me that people ruin their goals is um, life's lessons. Failure to learn from life's lessons. My goodness, people knock their head against the same wall over and over. Let's look at Proverbs 15 and seven. Proverbs 15, chapter 15, verse seven. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, they spread knowledge, but the heart of the fool does not do so. A fool is one that doesn't walk in wisdom. Okay, that's the definition. So God said to me that um, failing to learn from life's lessons is another way that people ruin their goals. And we know that um, the definition, we hear the definition of insanity as doing um, the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. But this is the twist he gave me. He said, the definition of insanity is only true where the scenery and the atmosphere has not changed. <laughs> I love that. Doing the same thing over and over in the same environment and expecting a different outcome is insanity. But God said, sometimes it's not what you're doing, it's where you're doing it. Yes, is where you're doing it. So change your atmosphere and you can change your outcome. 
You can change your outcome with the same actions that didn't work somewhere else. Time and place are critical to the success of anything. My goodness, that makes sense. The wisdom of a father in verse seven, it says the lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the fool doesn't do so. The knowledge that you get, spreading that knowledge, where am I? Am I speaking about uh, the right thing in the right place? If we think of vegetation, am I planting my orange tree in Antarctica or am I planting that orange tree in Florida? It's gonna produce a different outcome. So it's not necessarily what you're doing, but the atmosphere in which you're doing it. So failure to learn from life's lessons, not necessarily the change what you do, but where. 17, joining in the elephant parade. Oh my goodness, another way to ruin our goals, to not know the uniqueness that God has placed inside of you. And as I was writing, he said, don't hang on to the tail in front of you and trust their steps to lead you to your destiny. When you see an elephant parade, the elephant is hanging on to the tail of the one in front of them, and only the leader is making decisions on where to go. So he said, don't hang on to the person in front of you and, this, and expect them to know the destiny that he has for your life because you're gonna make it to the destination that they take you to, not necessarily the one that is destined for you. So um, for this scripture, I mean, for this point, we have the scripture of Jeremiah. I love Jeremiah chapter one. Some of you will know it by heart. Jeremiah chapter one, verses five through eight. He says, then the, then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, in verse five, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, my Lord. So that means our purpose is destined before we are conceived. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. There is a code inside of you that God has placed inside of you. And as you tap into your relationship with him, he will help you to discover it. That is such a major part of the equipping center. The equipping center, God gave us a, a, a moniker, if you will. It's discover, develop, deploy. Discover what? My code. Discover my code in him. And once I know it, then I, I need to develop it. I need to, to get it um, to become one with me, that I understand it, that I understand my uniqueness, that I'm not caught in the elephant parade, that I'm not just running behind somebody else like a lemming, Lemmings just follow one another, and if one falls over the cliff, then the next one falls, and the next one falls, because they don't know the uniqueness that is within them. And so he says, before you were born, I sanctified you. I didn't put you in a parade. I set you apart. I sanctified you. I separated you unto the code that is inside of you. And then he says, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. My Lord, I ordained you. I put my stamp upon you. I appointed you. I have a very specific destination for your life. Don't get caught in the elephant parade. There is only one view when you're not the first lead, when you're not the, the first elephant. If you are number two or anywhere after that, the scenery never changes and you will never make your destination. So don't get caught in that. Then the response from Jeremiah is very interesting. He says, ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I am a youth. He began to rebut God about his, his calling. He began to rebut, look what, I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm only young. Oh, my, 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 my. Everybody has a list of excuses. They might call them reasons, but are they reasons or excuses why they won't step into that call that God has for them? But then God says, don't tell me about what you think are your shortcomings. He says, don't say I am a youth. Don't come to me as if I didn't know who I was going to. Don't come to me as if I didn't know who I had given this assignment to. My God, my God in heaven, don't tell me that I am making a mistake. How is it that on one side we can say, oh God, you're the Lord, you're the Lord God who never fails, never makes a mistake. 
and then God calls you to do something and you go, oh God, I, I can't do that. Wow, how does that work? We have to be consistent. God says, don't say I am a youth, for you shall go. You shall go to all to whom I shall I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. He says, I'm not going to leave you out there to try to figure out what to say. He says, I am going to lead you step by step, ordered steps, the ordered steps of the Lord. He says, do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Now that tells me there's going to be some times where it's going to be some pressure. There's going to be some tribulation. There's going to be some, some um, hairy moments. He says, but don't be afraid of their faces. And I'm saying the same thing to you. Know your uniqueness. Don't join the elephant parade. Know what God placed inside of you. And when he sends you forward, don't tell him you cannot do what he has called you to do, created you to do, and place the code inside of you to do. Hallelujah. The next part, the Lord says, then the Lord, um, Jeremiah tells us, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, my God. And the Lord said to me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Wow. Wow. Right where you are, just receive that. Just receive that. Get in the receiving posture, which is generally hands turned up and just say, God, I receive your words. I receive your words for my life for my assignment and for my code. And it doesn't matter how old you are. Jeremiah was a youth. Um, Caleb was 80 years old when he finished the battles and was ready to, to rest in the Lord, not to die, but to rest in the Lord. He says, God, all these years I've done what you said, 40 years worth. He said, and now give me my mountain. So it doesn't matter what your age is. What matters is fulfilling, understanding, and fulfilling the code. So just receive that from God. I receive my uniqueness, Lord, and I refuse to be a part of the elephant parade. Yes, there will be some that don't understand my calling. Yes, they may look at me in ways that could incite fear, but I refuse to, to be afraid of their faces. For God, you have touched my lips and you have given me your words. And so I thank you for that. You have equipped me to live successfully with the code that you've placed inside me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. So now the next thing, the next thing he said to me was, um, another way that people ruin their goals is by not paying it now. Not paying it now. And yes, we are talking money. He said, take care of bills now so that you use the resources wisely. Use the resources wisely. Let's turn to 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 28. This is one of my favorites. Um, I love David. I love David. I love the life of David. Um, David oftentimes he gets mischaracterized because of one thing that he did. But David's life was so much more than that one event. And I love um, Chronicles tells us about his life. And so if we look at 1 Chronicles 28. So at this point, David has assembled everything. God has told him that he won't be able to um, build the temple for him that he wanted to build for him because he was a man of blood. However, he said, your son will build the temple. And so David, all of this time has been amassing all of these wonderful treasures to offer unto the Lord. And in this, ver in this chapter, he begins to tell Solomon about um, preparing his, the instructions to build the temple. And then they go all the way through 29. They have the offerings for building the temple. And then David begins to give praise in chapter 29. And we're talking about using money wisely, using money wisely. And this is what David said unto God in praises to him. He said, O Lord, our God, 
all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. How beautiful is that? All of this abundance, right above that, if you'll look in verse um, 13 and 14, First um, Chronicles chapter 29, 13 and 14, he says, now therefore our God, this is David talking to God. He says, we thank you and praise your glorious name, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? All of these treasures, the gold, the silver, um, the, the money, everything, oh my gosh, the ivory, everything that they had collected over the years to build this temple. He said, for all things come from you and of your own we have given you. So what am I saying? He says we ruin our goals when we don't handle his resources wisely. When we don't take what he has given us and pay it now. Don't amass bills. Bills are um, one of the things that the Bible says makes us a slave to the lender. So pay your, when, when we can, pay it now. And if you have a bill that you don't have the money for, it all belongs to him. David said, of thine own have, you, have we given unto you. Out of all of these things that we've collected, we understand that it has come from your hands. Amen. So a proper way of looking at bills and, and money. Pay bills now. If you don't have the money for them in your hands, ask the Lord for that transfer. Call that transfer into you and then use the money wisely. Amen. So the next thing, number 19, another way that people ruin their goals is by ruining their name. Oh my goodness, ruining their name. There's a couple of names right now in the earth. I'm really glad that's not my last name. And I'm sure you can think of a, a couple yourself. Let's look at Proverbs chapter 22. This is a really popular verse, and it says, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. So a good name and favor. So he says, care about your credibility and your credit. My goodness, here we are. Care about your credit and your credibility. Those two walk together. And then he said, remember, we talked about this one last week. Remember, success doesn't happen in a vacuum. Just like sin, when we do something that misses the mark, it affects those that are closest to us. It affects those that we are connected with. It affects those that are tied in to that thing. If you have a CEO that, that kites money and then eventually the feds kept um, catch up with them, when they catch up with them, the whole list of employees gets sent home because that thing, that sin, missing that mark, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Even though they may have thought they were doing it in a vacuum, it's not, it has extensions to the people that are already, I mean, that are also tied to that business. Success has the same. We don't have success in a, in a vacuum. When we are successful, it affects the whole, the whole um, um, system of, of connections that we have. It's like a ripple. Like when you throw a rock or a pebble into a pond and you see that ripple starts, success has that same effect. So don't ruin your name. Don't ruin your credit. Don't ruin your credibility. We need our connections and we need our reputations to be good, to bring God glory in each and every one of those connections. If this is an area that you're challenged in, place it before God and watch him do what only he can do. Amen. Number 20, another way that we ruin our goals, failure to learn from failure. Ha! Seems to be a new concept that's kind of taking on um, popularity, but this is a God principle. Don't ignore failure. Don't ignore it, 
Employ it. Make failure your employee. Make it your trainer. Make it work for you today. Make it work for your future. Make it work so that the lessons that you learn from it begin to um, teach you and lead you into the right place. Lead you into the proper place. Take instruction from those that have gone before you. Instruction from those that have done what you want to do. Not that you're gonna copy them because we're not in the elephant parade, but there is information that they may have that can help you learn, why did this not work for me? What happened here? Why did, why did it look like it would work on paper, but when I did it, it didn't work? There may be people that can give you instruction, just like we read in Proverbs 15 and five, that, um, I don't know if we read that actually, it says, a fool despises his father's instruction, but he who receives correction is prudent. We need to be open to good correction. Don't, don't feel like, oh man, I'm so tired of you correcting me. I'm so tired of somebody always telling me, no, receive instruction. If it applies, let it better you. But if it doesn't apply, then toss it and move on. But learn from your failures. Amen. Now we are on number 21 and number 21, Lord have mercy. We might end up camping here. I'm not sure if we'll get to get to get past this one. He said a, a powerful way that people ruin their goals is by choosing personality over purpose. My God in heaven. Choosing personality over purpose. My God, what? Choosing personality over purpose. I mean, I could go 20 directions, but the notes that I have during my download is, it is not necessary to be friends with everyone. Tell your children, <laughs> tell your, your children that we don't make friends just by social media. Friends are made by relationship, but anyway, that's another one. It is not necessary to be friends with everyone, but it is necessary to recognize and respect the gifts inside everyone that you work with. Okay. It is not necessary to be friends with everyone, but it is necessary to recognize and respect the gifts inside each individual that you may work with or come in contact with. The purpose or the goal, the goal is the focus, not the friendship. The purpose of your connection is the goal, not the friendship. Yeah, do you wanna have great friends? Absolutely, but not over purpose, not over purpose. I'll give you an example and then we'll, I'll give you a life example and then we'll go to the Bible's life examples a personal life example. Um, Alexander had three teachers in his elementary and junior year, junior, wait a minute, his elementary and middle school time that there were three teachers in that span of eight years that um, I needed to have a conversation with. Every one of them, but each of them were good teachers. They were great teachers, however, they had some issues when it came to personality. And so I had to have very clear conversations with them that it was important that the goal, the purpose of him being in that class was important and more important than us being friends and being chummy. And so after we had that discussion, things worked really well. I was not, I was not rude, any of those things, but the purpose had to come before being liked. And some people get so caught up with being liked, wanting to smile and laugh their way through everything. No, God is not about being liked. And we see that with Jesus. He is about purpose. Let's look at John chapter, let's look at John chapter nine. We're gonna go to John chapter nine and we're gonna go to John chapter 12. But let's look at nine. The, in nine, we are looking at this account. Man, this is really sad. The Pharisees excommunicated this man that Jesus had healed. 
Um, and Jesus healed him, told him to go wash in the pool. And then, of course, his eyes would no longer be blind, that he would be able to see. And so when the Pharisees found out about him, they brought him um, to the council to be reviewed. And they said, no, this was a Sabbath day and Jesus healed his eyes. And they go through this whole thing. Let's look at verse 15, um, John 9 and 15. Then the Pharisees also asked him, the man, again, how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because, you o because he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. There are some people, they're not gonna understand how your purpose is unfolding like it is. And they may even try to verify, but you stick to your purpose above personality. They said in verse 19, and they asked them saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered them and said, this right here, we know that this is our son and we know that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. For he is of age, ask him. He will speak for himself. There is a big message in there. His parents, verse 22, said these things because they chose personality over purpose. They chose what people would think over purpose. They said, the Bible says, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had all had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, he would be put out of the church. He would be put out of the synagogue. So instead of standing on truth, standing on purpose, they're blind. Their son that was blind from, from birth can now see. And instead of standing in the purpose of what God was doing through that miracle, they chose their church membership. They said, we want to be a part of the synagogue more than we want to say, yes, Jesus did this for our son. It was not the purpose that they focused on. It was their, their relationship to the Pharisees. It was their status, their standing um, in the church. And God was not pleased with that. We'll stop right there and we'll go on to another place. John 12. John 12. My goodness, it's another time. Um, John 12, verse 42 says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. Oh, my Lord, here we are again. Lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Choosing the things that really don't matter over the thing that matters most. For they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. That's what my Bible says. Then Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. God says that he has come as a light into the world and whoever believes in him, that we should not abide we should not live we should not make our abode in an unhappy place so it doesn't matter what people think and what what the jews or the pharisees thought we have to choose purpose we have to choose our our purpose that code that's within us over personality over fear over what people may think over what people may say 
and watch God do what only he can do. That is our number 21. My Lord, my Lord. But, um, number 22. Quite simply, he said some people ruin their goals because they give up. Do not allow weariness to cloud your judgment. Sometimes people get to um, the finish line and they don't know they're so close to the finish line and they become weary and then their, their judgment gets a little cloudy. We saw that happen even in this pandemic. Man, when we first went into quarantine, when everything shut down, everybody went to the grocery store and man, they cooked like it was Thanksgiving every day. <laughs> we saw all these different pictures on Facebook and all oh, this big spread and all this food. Man, a couple of months into it, we were starting to see bologna sandwiches and bottle of water. <laughs> they were starting to become weary with this process. Man, I'm tired of staying in the house. I'm tired of not being able to go anywhere. I'm tired of not being able to see my friends. I'm tired of not going to see my family. And so the first holiday comes along, Memorial Day, what happens? I'm tired of this, I'm going out, I'm going here. And people began to, to gather together. And in that gathering, they became weary, they became fatigued with hanging on to choke out this virus. And we saw a spike in the numbers. And the same thing can happen as we walk, walk out our lives. God said, don't quit when what you know is working works. You may get weary, but don't, don't quit. Don't allow weariness to cloud your judgment. You will reap if you faint not. The thing about principles is if they're true when you're excited about them, they're still true when you're not excited about them. They're true when you're ready to rip and run and go and produce, and they're true when you're tired and you're ready to throw in the towel. Don't give up. And then he told me this, this is amazing. He said, weariness says to quit while the goal is still breathing. Weariness says to quit while your goal, while your purpose is still breathing and has an expectation of you. So don't quit on your purpose. Don't quit on your goals. Don't ruin it. Stay in and follow the same principles that God gave you at the beginning, and they'll take you to the end. Amen. The next one was, a, was it sounds, um, it sounds counter, counterintuitive, but it, he said, some people ruin their goals by losing count of their effort. And what that really means is they, they lose um, the appraisal of their effort. They lose the appraisal, appraisal of their effort, but your goal is worth your effort. Proverbs 14, 23 says to us that there is profit in all work. And so even though it may look like you're not making, not making strides, not moving forward, you are. There is profit in all work. So in the end, don't, don't count. Know that there is value in your work and just do what needs to be done. And then I think this one may be our last one. Don't prejudge. Ha! Yes, say that out loud. Don't prejudge. What does that mean? Don't make a decision before you know the end. Don't prejudge. Let's look at 2 Kings chapter 5. This will probably be our last one. 2 Kings chapter 5. Don't prejudge. Don't ruin your goals by prejudging. Don't ruin your purpose. Don't miss the code. Don't miss cracking the code by prejudging. What does that mean? It means don't think you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense without knowledge, without his instruction, without wisdom, without patience. Don't think you know what makes sense and what doesn't make sense if you're not familiar. Don't prejudge. Look at this, 2 Kings chapter five, verse one. 
Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master. Because of him, the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. He was amazing. He was powerful. He was valiant. And he also had leprosy. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman, on Naaman's wife. Now, it's very interesting that they brought back a, a little girl from Israel. She had favor on her life. She was a chosen one. Then she said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel. Then the king of Syria said, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing, my Lord. Then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman, my servant to you, that you may heal him of his leprosy. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him? of his leprosy therefore please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me he said man you're trying to start a war you're trying to start a fight you're trying to make me responsible for what i'm not responsible for so it was when elisha the man of god heard that the king of israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king saying why have you torn your clothes i tell you i love elisha why have you torn your clothes please let him come to me and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. <laughs> I know this is too big for you, king. Go ahead and send Naaman to me. And he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. There is a mouthpiece of God. There is someone that can rise above the natural um, laws and produce the miracles that come from the kingdom of God. Then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me. He's prejudging. God said, don't think you know what makes sense and what you think doesn't make sense. He says, surely he'll come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. <laughs> he had a vision of how this was going to work. And sometimes we can have a vision of how we think something is going to work. And when it doesn't go that way, we prejudge what's happening instead of judging what we thought. In verse 12, are not the Abana and the Farfa, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Now he's judging how God's going to do this thing, what he's going to use to do this thing. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away, the Bible says, in a rage. Man, this man is smart, he's strategic. He's knowledgeable, he's valiant, and he's a prideful leper. He's a proud leper, a haughty leper. Man, verse 13, and his servants came near and spoke to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you have not done it? So they are appealing to that part of him. Yeah, that he could say, yes, I did something great. But now he's not being asked to do something great. He's being asked to do something base. Something simple. Something that a man of his stature would not be asked to do. 
He says, how much more than when he says to you, wash. Just wash and be clean. 14, so he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. My God. My God. How beautiful. How beautiful. Don't think that you have it all figured out. Don't prejudge it. If God is asking you to do something that you haven't seen before, he's calling you to be a pioneer. He's calling you to be a pioneer in whatever area that is. You know, somebody has to invent everything that we have. Has to reinvent, has to recycle, has to repurpose. Solomon said there's nothing new in the earth, but we're not always doing it the same way. So I want to encourage you, if you're having these magnificent ideas, these witty ideas and great inventions that God is downloading into your heart, don't prejudge it. Don't prejudge it. Don't think you can't do it. Don't be like Jeremiah and discount the value of your youth. God is doing an amazing and a new thing in you. And I want to encourage you to allow him to do that. And the last one, this will be the last one because it's so fitting, is another way that we ruin our goals is a simple lack of order. Systems bring success. Systems help us manage our energy and our resources at an optimum level, at an optimum level. When we have systems in place, we can make decisions. When we have systems in place, everything has its place. Systems will adjust and shift over, over time, but systems themselves will not become obsolete. So we have systems, how about this? Some of you will remember the card catalog at the library. Some of you will remember Microfish. So the system was to order the books so that we knew where to find them. And now we have a new system for how to do that through electronics. What we want to do is still the same, um, but the old way doesn't work anymore. But the goal is the same. So systems will always be present in lasting success in the way that we do things. And so the last one is a lack of order. So bring order to the things that God is, is showing you for your life. Man, I'm going to continue to work. I have several more of these where God is just bringing wisdom, wisdom for us from our hearts, from his heart um, to our hearts on how to be successful in decoding this wonderful purpose that he has inside of us. And so I, I speak that to you and I speak blessings over your life and success in your search, success in your search for your, your code and the details of your code. Father, I thank you, Lord God, for this time that you've given us to, um, to glean from your wisdom, God, and to glean from your word. Father, to examine ourselves and see, God, what's in our code? What is it that we um, are to deposit in this earth while we are here? God, I thank you for it. I thank you, Lord God, for the eyes of our understanding being opened and being enlightened, God, that we would understand your love for us, God. And because of your love, God, you withhold nothing um, from those that walk uprightly before you, looking, looking for your wisdom, looking for your way, wanting to please you in all that we say or do, God, not valuing um, personalities over purpose, God, not quitting and tripping on the finish line, God, not prejudging, God, not doubting ourselves, not thinking that we're not equipped when you've asked us to do things. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for success. I thank you for favor. I thank you, Lord God, for understanding. I thank you for um, your wisdom. I thank you for knowledge. I thank you for godly alliances, godly connections, God. I thank you, Lord God, that we don't have evil communications, God, that bring forth bad manners, God, but we have communications that are pleasing in your sight, God. I thank you for it, Lord, and I just speak, I speak um, fulfillment, God, to the purpose and the goals that you have established for your people, and I thank you, Lord God, that in due season, 
we shall see it, God, if we faint not. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go be great. Go be great. Woo!